Coming up on DTNS, we break down the new OnePlus 8 phones, and Patrick Norton recommends websites to help you pick a gaming PC, plus tips on how to get free TV. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, April 14th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I am Sarah Lane. And from Alamos, Colorado, I'm Patrick Norton. And occasionally I'll even remember which person I am. Uh-oh. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm Roger sure. Chang, the show's producer. <laughs> it's right there. It's written right after, under Sarah. I'm sorry. I should, should have told you that earlier. Today, you are Patrick. <laughs> Uh, we were just having a wide-ranging conversation about Mongolian and uh, throwing trash cans in Manhattan. All kinds of good stuff at patreon.com slash DTNS, where you can get good day internet. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. A new version of Minecraft using ray tracing graphics will arrive April 16th as a free update on Windows 10. Minecraft RTX beta was co-developed with NVIDIA and needs an NVIDIA GeForce RTX graphics card to use the DirectX ray tracing API and NVIDIA's DLSS pipeline, which can improve frame rates by upscaling resolution. The beta will not support online play or world seeds at launch. The distributed computing project Folding at Home has reached a peak performance of 1.5 exaflops making it more than seven times faster than the world's fastest supercomputer. That's the summit of Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I know. Folding at home beat supercomputers to the petaflop milestone back in 2007 as well, right after it launched on the PlayStation 3. Uh, Folding at home had been declining. It has gone from 30,000 volunteers in February to more than 700,000 now. Part of the increase came from users leaving the SETI at home project, which announced it was shutting down March 31st. But Folding at home, of course, is also looking for proteins that combine to SARS-CoV-2 and inactivate it. And that has really been the reason uh, that more people have jumped in. So it is now the only exaflop system in the world, folding at home. Good luck finding that binding protein, please. I just want to say, if you need a team, Team Texilla is still up there. Robert Heron found that out this week, and we're still in the top 25. Nice. It goes all the way back to DLTV. So if you're looking for a folding at home team, by all means. <laughs> Very cool. (laughs) Uh, According to government data, March iPhone shipments in China rose 19% from a year earlier to 2.5 million units. Now, iPhone shipments in February in China fell more than 60% year on year. So, interesting difference between the two months. Government data shows the overall smartphone market, however, shrunk by roughly 20% to 21 million shipments. Yeah, if you're looking to see how fast China jumps back, you're going to want to see those numbers. The Entertainment Software Rating Board, or ESRB, announced a new label for games that offer in-game purchases of loot boxes or other randomized rewards. The ESRB says the snappily named label, in-game purchases, including random items, will be applied to loot boxes, gotcha games, items, or card packs, prize wheels, treasure chests, and more. Microsoft, Nintendo, Sony, and many game publishers have all committed to disclosing the odds of receiving items from loot boxes with 2020 as a target for that policy to take effect. That's now, so it needs to take effect soon. Uh, Speaking of Nintendo, the Nintendo Switch got system software update 10.0.0 on Monday, which lets console owners remap controller buttons on the Joy-Con controllers and also Nintendo Switch Pro controller and transfer data back and forth between system memory and SD cards. Animal Crossing New Horizons also gets some new user icons for players of that game that hardly anyone's ever heard of. Tom Nook, Timmy and Tommy Nook, Isabel Wilbur, CJ, and Flick. I like Flick. You can get uh, good prices from Flick. Apple is aggregating a non Anonymized data from its Apple Maps users in a mobility trends report. Uh, information is not tied to Apple IDs. Apple di- doesn't even maintain a history of where individuals have been. Uh, this is all randomized. And the data is available from Apple's website as a CSV for anyone to access. Uh, but it is meant for use by state and federal policymakers to assess how well social distancing measures are working, similar to what Google did a few weeks ago. All right, let's talk a little bit more about that new OnePlus phone. Yes, it's exciting, many a folk. OnePlus announced the OnePlus 8 and 8 Pro handsets running on the Snapdragon 865 chip with support for sub 6 gigahertz 5G and Wi-Fi 6. The OnePlus 8 Pro has a 6.78 inch 3168 by 1440 120 hertz OLED display, comes with a 48 megapixel main camera, 3X hybrid and 3X digital zoom telephoto lens, a color filter camera and an ultra wide lens with a 120 degree angle. 
model. Capable of fast wireless charging with a $70 OnePlus 30-watt wireless charger, as well as a 10-watt Qi charger. The OnePlus 8 Pro is also IP68 rated for water up to 1.5 meters for up to 30 minutes. And it ditched the pop-up camera so it can fit into a 4510 milliamp battery. OnePlus 8 Pro starts at $899 for 8 gigs of RAM and 128 gigabytes of storage, or $999 for 12 gigs of RAM and 256 gigs of storage. The base model, OnePlus 8, has a 6.55-inch 90 hertz display, 48-megapixel sensor, 16-megapixel ultra-wide lens, and 2-megapixel macro lens with a 4,300 milliamp battery starting at $699 with 8 gigs of RAM and 20, uh, 128 gigs of storage and $799 for 12 gigs of RAM and 256 gigs of storage. A millimeter wave 5G version will be available in the U.S. from Verizon for $799. Both models come in black, blue, green with an interstellar glow option. Coming to the U.S. on April 29th and Europe on April 21st. Yeah, uh, those are good specs. Uh, it's good to tell people about them, but I'm sure that no one heard anything except seven hundred ninety nine dollars. That that seems to be the reaction out there uh, to the OnePlus phone, which has some lovely improvements. Ba basically, what they did is they made the OnePlus Eight, the base model, the upgrade from the OnePlus Seven Pro, and then they added a lot of cool stuff to the Pro. And because they had to add more cool stuff to the Pro, they had to raise the price. They've got that fast wireless charging. They've got that IPS uh, rating. They, you know, they they've got the 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 stellar camera option there. Uh, and so it's going to cost you eight hundred ninety nine dollars to start. That's still cheaper than Samsung and Apple because this is their yeah. top level. But it's more expensive than OnePlus users are used to. It's a weird. I mean, buying a cell phone right now, if you're buying a flagship. I mean, it's it's sticker shock. It's incredible that you're looking at like thirteen hundred dollar flagships, and yeah, I, I get it. On one hand, like I, I look at this and I think, okay, I, fewer megapixels, bigger pixels, better low light performance on the camera would be killer. But this is so inexpensive compared to what you're getting uh, from what I will affectionately call the majors. Right I now. mean, this is uh, by all accounts, and I, I've seen multiple outlets say this, uh, the best flagship smartphone released in 2020. Uh, that's faint praise for 2020, to be honest, but but it, it's a it's a really good phone uh, for the price. It's just more expensive than people are used to from that company. A court in Nanterre, France, has ruled that Amazon may only accept orders for groceries, hygiene, and health-related products in France for a month. So no other things, no video games, uh, nothing. If it's not groceries, hygiene, or health-related, Amazon isn't allowed to ship it while it reviews its health and safety practices in order to better protect its workers. Amazon has been prioritizing essential items, but not limiting orders. It just took longer to ship the other stuff. Uh, this order is subject to extension on review by the court. So the court said, uh, unless you can show us that it's safer for your workers, we're not going to let you ship anything but groceries, hygiene, and health-related products even in a month. You've got you've to do better. This is a tough one because on the side of France, you say, well, yeah, the Amazon workers should 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 come first. And if Amazon has to prioritize that um, ahead of non-essential items for customers, um, which either means kind of postponed indefinitely or at least, you know, for a little while, then on the surface, that sounds great. But if Amazon effectively sort of winds down a huge part of its business in the country, well, that's not good for the workers either. Yeah, uh, exactly. I mean, that would be what Amazon would would argue is that they they need to to be funding the ability to improve this. I don't think Amazon's running out of money anytime soon. That's yeah. you know a fair <laughs> point. But uh, uh, but this is the the hardest that anyone has cracked down on Amazon, who have been criticized both from within and without uh, for not doing enough to protect worker safety. I mean, let's be clear, they have done things. They are providing mass and sanitization. It's not like they're not doing anything. Uh, but people are saying that it is kind of impossible in some of these warehouses to maintain proper social distancing. I, it, it, I mean, it's a microcosm of the argument that we're hearing in a lot of places where it's like, you know, it, it, we, we, do we save the economy or do we save people? And I think there's a middle ground that everybody serves. But, you know, case in point, there was a, a, a meatpacking plant in South Dakota where they mm -hmm. shut down because there was a breakout of 300 cases of coronavirus because you're right up next to each other. You're constantly moving. PPE is difficult to wear or maybe ineffective or maybe they didn't have it. And that's a, 
you know, it's a miserable decision to have to make. Yeah, and 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 that was in a state where uh, the the orders to to do social distancing across the state were were late in coming, uh, so yeah. there it was it was spreading faster. Uh, France, on the other hand, you know, has has been on top of this <laughs> about the same as any other country uh, has. So it's not that there are big outbreaks in Amazon, but it's it's that the court is saying you you need to make sure there aren't, uh, and we need you to do more. Axios' sources say that Google has taken shipment of prototypes of its own processor design, codenamed Whitechapel, meant for Pixel smartphones in 2021 at the earliest, and eventually also Chromebooks. Google's new chip reportedly has an eight-core ARM processor, hardware optimized for machine learning, and was designed in cooperation with Samsung using five nanometer technology. Samsung manufactures iPhone chips as well and its own Exynos processors. Yeah, so this this is kind of the movement, right? I mean, we're seeing Apple doing this. There's a lot of rumors that they're going to do it more in their laptops as, as well. Uh, and it gives you more control in your hardware design to be able to design the chip yourself. In fact, uh, in, in our pre-show, Roger, uh, you pointed out that, that game consoles have done a similar thing in designing the chips and, and having the chip makers build them, but, but designing them custom in the past uh, for the consoles. Yeah, uh, it's 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 a very interesting thing, and part of the one of the things they learned was um, uh, it worked well up to a point where g coding games became incredibly complex and complicated affairs, and that having a standardized you know uh, uh, instruction set architecture would would help alleviate some of the costs of not only just developing games but being able to port it from system to system. I would imagine that uh, with this, that uh, Google is not going to move too far out from. Well, they're using ARM, right? Yeah. If they're using, they're using ARM, then they they avoid yeah. most of those instruction set problems. Absolutely, Patrick. What do you think of this? I I mean I kind of find it fascinating. I'm also kind of giggling because you know the the Sony place it was it I can't remember which ep which PlayStation it was that were like we're going to move in an entirely different direction from the rest of the industry and it created like this series of nightmare for developers who wanted to to work multi platform on games. Uh, you but, could argue it was either the PS2 or the PS3 because they both yeah. kind of threw uh, yeah. caution to the wind. I was going to say developers under the bus, but caution to the wind is a good probably a better way to say that was it. the wind over the bus. Yeah. The wind over the bus or under the bus. I think this is inevitable in a lot of cases. Uh, I also think Google's, I want to learn, I'm still trying to figure out what Google's doing with machine learning and and as much as my brain as I keep applying to machine learning on phones, I still find it so poorly documented. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm curious to see what they do with that section of the phone and whether or not it does anything that I particularly want Google to be doing on something in my pocket. Well, basically, the the big benefit of doing ma machine learning more on, on hardware, and that's not specific to Google designing it no. itself, uh, but the, the big benefit you get is that you don't have to send your data to the cloud uh, right. to inform the model. Uh, and that's great for privacy, which everybody wants Google to take more steps to protect. So, um, you know, that's that's good. Uh, Just I, they're doing it on the phone doesn't mean they won't suck it back up into the mothership. <laughs> yeah, well, if you don't trust Google, then nothing they do is ever going to be good and, enough. Right? And you, yeah. technically, yeah. you would be able to design a chip that would adhere more to whatever you're writing so you could get more efficiency out of it, thereby yeah, yeah. You know, impacting the battery less. Absolutely. But battery and performance are the big benefits that you're going to get in being able to design this. And having, I mean, Samsung is basically becoming the manufacturer to the designers, right? It's not It's not like Google and Apple are making these chips. They're designing them uh, because they work with their designs, but they're still asking Samsung in both cases uh, to manufacture them. So that's interesting. I'm just curious how this rolls up. So sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm curious too. I was going to say like, yeah, Qualcomm versus Apple versus now Google versus Samsung. Uh, I'm kind of curious at what point is does become harder and harder for smaller cell phone manufacturers to keep pace. At what it's... point does Qualcomm decide to uh, offer design to smaller yeah. manufacturers as a way to compete with Samsung on this, right? Bingo. Yeah. More details are coming out about the Apple Google contact tracing API. This is the one we've been talking about basically since last Thursday when we were talking about an MIT program that's very similar uh, to encourage adoption. That's one of the problems uh, Singapore ran into. They only got 12% adoption on their Bluetooth tracker, uh, which made it less 
less helpful. Uh, so to encourage adoption, users of the Apple Google API will be able to opt into the system once it rolls out on the operating system level, which again is the second phase, so that's not gonna be for a while, uh, but they'll be able to opt into the system without having to download an app. That makes it easier for people to do. You'll get a prompt from your operating system saying, hey, would you like to enroll in this and protect your privacy? Here's what you can learn about it. If a user is then notified that they may have come in contact with someone infected, they will then be directed to download the relevant health agency app for more information. The idea is getting people to download a health agency app is hard unless they have a real reason. So having it at the operating system level that they can opt in into off of a notification will increase adoption. And then you have them download the app when they need it. Also, Google will distribute the operating system update through Google Play services, meaning it will not have to wait for carrier adoption. That was one other concern people were asking about. Apple and Google have explicitly said that the system will not be used for any other purpose. We've talked previously on the show about the anonymization, uh, the rotating numbers, how this doesn't geolocate, it doesn't store any identifying information, uh, that no one, government or private, will be able to use this for anything other than tracking COVID-19, uh, and it will be shut down when health agencies deem the threat has passed. Again, if you don't trust Google or Apple, then none of that makes any difference, but they're saying the things that you want to hear them say. Yeah, if you yeah, if you're like neither of these companies, you know, I just I just don't believe what they're saying about data, then you wouldn't opt in. Otherwise, this sounds like the most frictionless version of the way that this rollout should go. Yeah, I, 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 we, this is just an update to kind of bring people up to speed on this because there's a lot of misunderstanding about what they're doing. But my problem isn't with the way they're rolling it out. This feels like a very well done API for protecting privacy and providing information. Uh, I just don't know how helpful this is beyond the actual like widespread testing, social distancing, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 isolation as well as human tracing. It may help with the human tracing, with the human interviews as a supplement to that, in which case it's worth doing. And it seems to me like they're doing it right. Good for them. Uh, also good for somebody, maybe. Facebook <laughs> launched an experimental app for the Apple Watch called Kit. That's short for Keep in Touch, just like a yearbook signature. By scanning a QR code or entering a code manually on the web, you can set up the app to stay in touch with a messenger contact, kind of designed for your closest friends or maybe a family member. After that, you can tap your watch to send voice recordings, emoji, location sharing, scribbles, or even use speech to text. Now, this is just for Apple Watch, so this is not something that I can take right. advantage of. Uh, if for some reason I had more contacts on Facebook Messenger than maybe I did using iMessage on iOS or, you know, a big uh, list of folks that I talked to using SMS, this would make a lot of sense to me. Tom, you do have an Apple Watch. I mean, is this something that you're like, ah, just what I wanted? I, I have friends and relatives on, that only use Messenger to contact me, so I, I'm the target audience for this experimental app. This is one of those <laughs> Facebook apps that, uh, that that they throw out there and they see if it sticks. Uh, if nobody picks it up, then they retire it. Uh, so I try not to be too critical of these things because this is a good example of, the, of, a, of a research agency saying, let's come up with ideas and try them and see if they work. I get the idea here, which is, my nephew, Ben, in Australia, uh, we talk on Messenger. That's how we talk. And if I want to talk to him and I'm out and about with my watch, it would be easy for me to be like, okay, Ben's my contact. Now I can just tap on it, say, hey, I'm you know, out and just thought of you, blah, 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 blah. I don't use Messenger that way. I don't use Messenger for urgent communication, but I can imagine that there are plenty of people who do, who are, mm -hmm. who are going to, you know, coordinate with people on grocery pickups or, or heading to the testing center or whatever. And this would be, this would make it easier to contact them using your watch instead of having to pull out the phone. So it seems. Sure the ben, is it a pretty sure the Venn diagram between Apple watch users and Facebook is probably staggeringly high or should say. Yeah, messenger. it's probably pretty thick. Yeah. One would yeah. think so. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not saying that this is that keep in touch is for sure going to be the hit. Uh, but this is one I at least understand better uh, than some of the other experiments they've tried. <laughs> hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. There's a lot of free television out there right now, folks. Sling TV just launched Happy Hour Across America. Now, that does not involve a beverage or chicken wings, according to Sling's own press release. They specifically said, we can't give you chicken wings or a beverage. Uh, but they are offering free TV 
every evening from 5 p.m. to midnight local time. Uh, so whatever time zone you're in, you'll get it from 5 p.m. to midnight. The idea is that they th say that, that people stop watching news around 6 p.m. and switch to entertainment. So they want to give them some free television to entertain them uh, and then try to convert them into paying Sling TV customers once this limited time offer ends. Uh, if you want to try this out, you have to be a new customer and enter an email address at sling.com slash deals slash happy dash hour. But you don't need to enter a credit card. Just the, They just want to be able to bug you about signing up for the service later. They don't want to take your payment information. Uh, and if you do that, you get access to 50 plus channels on the Sling TV Blue service. The Blue, I believe, is the one that has the NBC channels. Orange is the one that has the Fox channels. Uh, but Patrick, you pointed out uh, that there are a lot of these kinds of trials out there right now. Yeah, and I, and I just want to spread some extra love on Sling TV for any time you can sign up for a trial without a credit card. You know, that's that's a big positive for me. Um, it's kind of crazy. Consumer Reports did one of the better uh, uh, collections I've seen of it. But the thing really we were talking about on, on AVXL was that uh, HBO is doing their stay home box office. They're making like 500 hours of programming available. Um, the Sopranos, The Wire, films, documentaries, and it's running over uh, HBO Go and uh, or it should be uh, uh, HBO Now or HBO Go. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool, actually. Um, the uh, you know I'm also really curious about HBO Max, but that's a totally different subject. Um, Hulu is given 30 days. Netflix is, has a 30 day free trial. Uh, the new QB, which I hope I am saying right, Qu the Quibi, quick like Quick Bites. Quibi, yeah, Quibi. Oh, I've seen three commercials for it. I've pre-signed up for it, and I still can't say the names. A uh, Quibi. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you should uh, definitely tr check out Fresh Daily from Rotten Tomatoes on Quibi as produced by my wife's team. Good to know. Good to know, sir. The uh, That's but, how uh, I know how to pronounce it. <laughs> well, at least one of us knows. Thankfully, we're spreading good information here. Um, but, I mean, you know, Amazon Prime Video is a 30-day free trial, uh, Acorn TV. It's kind of crazy. Like, the one I'm actually looking at and circling is CBS All Access, um, you know, so I can finally – at least through the almost the end of April, watch Star Trek Picard without actually mm -hmm. having to pay any money for it, which I actually found now feel very small and cheap for saying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> it felt better in your head before you said it that way. <laughs> yeah, it's just some things just don't sound good out loud. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, props for HBO and Sling and everybody else that are actually trying to, to make some more content available without charging people any Money. Yeah, I mean, Showtime, Shudder, Sundance Now, Urban Movie Channel. I mean, yeah. there's so many of these. Apple TV Plus even putting uh, some of their content out there for free. AT&T. Uh, <laughs> like, you know, you don't hear a lot of nice things said about AT&T, but they're doing some free free trials here. So, uh, <laughs> and for AT some, is doing nice things. For some reason, NBC has decided to stick to its plan to release its streaming service, Peacock, only to Comcast Cable TV customers starting April 15th. So April 15th, Sarah, I guess you can get it of us, uh, <laughs> but none of the rest of us can try it until July 15th when non-cable customers are still scheduled to get access. And they they bent over backwards trying to explain, oh, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, we're sticking to our time schedule because you know our, our work schedules have been disrupted uh, by the, having to work from home and all this stuff. And I, I get all of that. But I just can't imagine that they wouldn't want to put this out for a wider number of people for free when their their own properties are doing free trials in other situations. I'm, I'm I mean, I'm not a Comcast cable TV customer either. I thought maybe you were in a Comcast region. I don't know why I thought that. There's I am in a Comcast yeah. region, but I don't have a TV. But you don't pay plan. for it. Yeah. No. Okay. It's but at least you only. would have the opportunity to try it right. if you wanted to spend money to get Comcast. That is true. <laughs> that is where that is where I have won over all of you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Potentially. Anyway, uh, before we we get off this topic, though, Patrick, I wanted uh, I know people love to hear about the different setups people use for streaming TV because there isn't the one way yet. There's not one best way. So w when you watch all these free streaming uh, services, what are you watching on? Uh, you know, ninety percent of my family's viewing back in our former home was a hundred inch projection screen and Apple TV. Although because of of the stuff I do with AV Excel and other places, I had Apple TV, Roku TV, mm -hmm. Android TV, and several other things connected at all times because I like my life to be complicated. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, uh, given the space constraints, everything's stuffed into the TV. We got like 90% of what we do is uh, is the Roku TV, a TCL 5 series television. Um, in uh, it's amazing. Like I hate television operating systems like WebOS on, on the LG OLED TVs isn't bad, but I have faith that just like every other TV operating system, uh, it will sort of 
you know, become crappy over time. So I just want to say it's kind of amazing how good the Roku TV stuff is, um, you know, and it's got everything we need, which has been really amazing. Uh, although all of our, you know, content in other areas, I do have a separate Apple TV that I use to do some of that stuff. But 90% of what we're doing, Roku OS on a TV uh, on what feels like a very, very tiny 43-inch television. It's and a really nice 43-inch television for <laughs> 250 bucks, but it's – not as majestic as what we're used to. <laughs> well, and, and if people are like, wait, why did he give up the screen? It's because uh, they, they switched to living in an RV. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so so you've got space constraints. And what are you using to stream when you're when you're moving around like that? Uh, well, basically, everything's going over. All of our Internet is either over a a box we got that came with a, a one year unlimited uh, AT&T data subscription, which is managed, but still unlimited, which is mm -hmm. amazing. Uh, and a uh, 100 gigabyte a month Sprint account, um, which, you know, Sprint's 4G map lies, but don't get me started on that because it will keep you here for the next three hours and it will be not safe for children. <laughs> Got it. Uh, yeah, Terriers, works, it's great. <laughs> they, 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 they love to, to claim speed and range in the same sentence when those things don't necessarily always overlap. So, yeah. Well, when, uh, I'm, there are other things to talk about today. <laughs> sure, sure. I won't start because I won't stop. <laughs> oh well, thank you, thank you for for sharing the the specs. I know there's a bunch of uh, Roku TCL fans uh, in the chat room, and in fact, that's what my wife uses in her office as as both her computer monitor and and a way to watch uh, TV when she relaxes. So that's cool. Nice. Uh, thanks to all those who participate in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Sarah, let's check out the mailbag. Oh, let's. R wanted to know, and this is actually great timing because Patrick's on the show today. My brother wants to buy his soon-to-be 14-year-old son a new gaming rig, but he's confused at what the best deals are and what the differences are between models. I know the bargain sites, but I have no idea what to look for in a good gaming machine or compare them. Thought you might know where to look. Oh my goodness. Um, just about every tech site, just about every website seems to have gaming PC picks or especially bargain sites. Um, you know, a lot of these are actually generating revenue and not particularly good value. Uh, if the website doesn't benchmark and review gaming PCs, the recommendations probably suck or are motivated by whatever they can get the best return on. Uh, I've, uh, you know, Tom's Hardware, PC Mag, several sites like that. Those are two of my favorites for looking to see what people are, uh, you know, finding is a good value. Um, the, the thing is, is is starting with the bargains is probably the worst way to pick out a gaming PC. It's mostly about CPU and GPU. Um, and prices can vary a lot. Uh, there's like a, you know, if you look at like a $700 gel G5 gaming desktop, there's no lights, there's no fans, there's no LED. Well, there's like one LED on the front. There's no glass door. But you get a vastly better GPU than, say, Digital Storm has a $700 Lynx config, which does have fancy LED fans and glass and stuff like that. So... Um, you got to kind of start with the CPU and the GPU and how much you actually want to spend. And there's not a whole lot. If you're just using a 1080p monitor, you don't have to spend a lot of money. Um, you know, you just don't need to. There's no point. You're wasting your GPU. Like, cause, you know, if you have an entry level GPU, they can do ultra settings at 1080p and decent frame rates. You don't need to go out and buy a $2,000 GPU. Um, PC parts leaderboard, uh, you know, give a shout out to Sebastian and the crew over there. Um, PC parts picker, they're great places to get an idea of what parts you should get given how much money you want to spend. I'll give you a hint right now, a Radeon RX 570, that's like your entry level GPU uh, and either like an Intel Core i3 9100F or a Ryzen 5 1600, that's your entry level GPU and a $500 to $700 system. And stepping up to a, a, a NVIDIA uh, 1600 series GPU or, or uh, S series um, is a little bit more expensive, but gives you more power. And for 1080p gaming, that's probably all you need. Uh, and so budget first, then look at PC Parts Picker and the leaderboard over at PCPer.com to figure out like what parts you should get for that money. And then you can start looking for bargains based on that. Excellent stuff. Thanks, man. Cool. Hey, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Dustin Campbell, Andrew Bradley, and Scott Hepburn. Also, thanks to Patrick Norton. A wealth of information. If there ever was someone with information, <laughs> it is you. Mr. Norton, let folks know where they can keep up with everything else you're up to. Uh, Robert Heron and I are recording another episode of AV Excel on Thursday, talking about home theater and audio, and that's avxcel.com. 
Hey, folks, thanks for uh, continuing to send in cool things to highlight at the end of the show. We're just trying to share the love out there. Uh, as more people are shut inside, more creators need your attention. And the Monterey Bay Aquarium in Monterey, mm -hmm. California, is offering online tours of the Animal Crossing New Horizons Museum on their Twitch oh, wow. channel. Uh, in fact, we, if you were listening to Friday's show, paleontologist Riley Black told us on Good Day Internet that the museum's fossil representations are pretty good. They're up to snuff. Uh, and the Museum and Animal Crossing also offers fish and insects. So experts in fish and insects from the Monterey Aquarium are joined by a Chicago Field Museum fossil expert uh, and have been doing what they would normally do in their own real-life locations, explaining the wonders of the natural world. But inside the Nintendo Switch game. Uh, you can see the Animal Crossing Museum tours at twitch.tv slash Monterey AQ. That's M-O-N-T-E-R-E-Y-A-Q. We'll have the link in the show notes as well. Uh, and man, uh, we got the nicest note in the world from somebody who's an events planner who it should be out of work, uh, but is using some technology to, to still be able to do some work doing online and virtual events and was able to step up their patronage. I can't tell you how that uh, made me tear up. Uh, so, so thank you to everybody who's been able to. We know not everybody can, and we are fine with that. If you can't continue to support us, we get it. It's tough times out there. Uh, but thanks to everybody who can do it at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. They've got you covered. We also want to have ourselves covered with your feedback. Cover us. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That is 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>